It is time for the second video on balance. Yes, I know the title that you just saw in the thumbnail of this video is going to make Enzo turn in his grave. But it's okay because the Ferrari California already did that. <coughs> but before we get right into it, I'm going to explain a little bit more about balance. We're moving on to gearboxes. I'm going to cover a few more details on what I talked about in the first video. If you haven't watched the first video, go watch it. The fact is, there are a billion other things that influence cars handling. What I'm saying is, a front mid-engine car can bite like an MR2. So let's get right into it. Yes, my apology. I mocked Audi for having the worst possible mainstream engine layout. But the fact is, Audi and many others that have the same engine layout have made mind blowingly fast cars. The Mitsubishi Evo, this shows what I said. Engine layout is just the foundation balance. It's not everything. To explain everything I mean, let's take a deep dive into the Evo 9. It's an amazing car and it has one of the most efficient, fastest, quickest four-wheel drive systems known to man. It has two names for two things it does. But right in the beginning of the Evo's life, with the first few Evos, like the Evo 3 and 4 and on, there was just one of them, and it's called Active Yaw Control. What this does is split the power between the right and left wheels most efficiently for cornering. So when you're taking a corner, more power will go to the outside wheels. And over the years they improved the system, the active center differential was added to the Evo. I think it works best in the Evo 9 and 7 personally those are my two favorite generations of the evo so the evo 9 it has a turbo inline four engine fully cast iron super beefed up big boy and yes it sits in front of the front axle power goes to an active center differential that splits the power 50 50 as standard front to back but it varies while driving so when you start understeering you put foot down more power will go to the rear wheels when you're oversteering, then more power will go to the front wheels. And there's the active yaw control that does its amazing job of splitting the power between the left and right wheels. So when you take corners, more power goes to the outside wheels. It's giving the most torque to the wheels that will use it most efficiently. It's called perfect power distribution. Opening the throttle during a corner, there is such perfect torque balance. The acceleration out of corners is so rapid, it's scary. Definitely one of my favorite cars, the Mitsubishi Lan Evo. So this is what Mitsubishi did to balance their imbalance. Because I mean, it's a four door, four seater car that has a boot that's supposed to take groceries, but it still must be a rapidly fast rally car. So they had to do what they had to do and they did it perfectly. But you can't get around the fact, Mitsubishi balanced an imbalance with an imbalance. It's just not perfect. My dream garage has an Evo 9, an Evo 6, an Evo 7, and an Evo 3. Doesn't mean they're perfect. They're rapidly fast, but they're not perfect. What I'm saying is, if the Evo was made to rather be a two-door coupe, they could manage to fit the engine behind the front axle, maybe even make it a VR4. So why? Why on earth did Mitsubishi do this? Well, you see, Rally has roads that have super loose gravel, bumps and unforgiving cambers and corners all over. So you do not want an MR2's twitchy behavior for handling. So what Mitsubishi did is make a naturally slower front end with a system that allows the driver with techniques of accelerator movement and brakes. He can make the car twitch if he wants to. He can make it go super agile around corners, but it's natural behavior from the foundation of building the car. It has a sluggish front end. That's how Mitsubishi Evo is. If it was just a rear wheel drive car, it would be super sluggish. A BMW M3 would have better turn in. I'm not saying the whole car is a bad car. It has an amazing chassis and everything else is built very well. But the space issue that put the engine in the front, in front of the front axle, this was all for driver ease. This was all to make it more of a drivable car. It doesn't add performance, cause the thing is, if it was like a Honda S2000 with the engine behind the front axle, it would be able to corner much faster. But the fact is the twitchiness of the S2000 will kill the driver by the first corner. You would need a godlike driver. 
Hey, but don't we get those? I bet Drift King could sort that out easily. He could drive that thing while reading a book like Clarkson. But then how on earth did Porsche manage to do rally? It's rear-engined, behind the rear wheels, behind the rear axle. <laughs> Go watch the first video if this is your question. A Porsche's handling is extremely different from a mid-engine or front mid-engine car. It can be in some situations easier to drive than a Honda S2000 or a Toyota MR2. All the weight is on the rear axle. So the rear is more planted than a mid-engine or front mid-engine car. The rear is naturally much less twitchy than a front mid-engine car or a mid-engine car. This is the whole reason there's such a thing as a mid-rear engine car. Because mid-engine is just too twitchy. And the fact that all the weight is on the back means the front is also slightly less grippy when you put foot down. But one of the other major weights that also affects your handling quite greatly, it's called a gearbox. Yes, it's the sister of the engine. To understand what I'm going to talk about, in drag racing, the principle to have the hardest launching, fastest car that literally can take any amount of power is to have a perfect center of gravity, a perfect center of mass. As you put foot down and the car squats and the tires try to push the car forward, the center of mass must be at the perfect angle for the tires to push directly on the center of mass, being transferred further backwards due to the squat, and not to be too high that it flips the car and not to be too low that all your horsepower is wasted effectively to nothing. Basically the tires must punch the center of mass in the chest and this is a perfectly balanced drag racing car. This is how the Dodge Demon can accelerate off the line at 2.004 G's. It does this and it's not even a four wheel drive. <laughs> Yes, exactly. It's perfectly balanced. Balance is the answer, not tricks. Okay, so now I know how to drag race a car. What does this have to do with gearboxes? I'm getting there. Let him cook now. Let him cook. Gearboxes are like engines. They very big weights that should be thought through very, very well. They're not as heavy as engines, but you see a midship engine layout and especially mid rear there's not a lot of space left for a gearbox because the engine is taking up all that space. You don't want to have the gearbox in front of the engine and then a drive shaft crawling up above the engine and then to the differential. That's just bad engineering. So what was invented to compensate for the space problem is called a transaxle. What it is is the face value name. It's a transaxle. It's combining the transmission with the axle and the differential. So the engine will be in the mid-rear position, then it's the differential, and then it's the gearbox. This makes up for the cramped lack of space in the middle of the car, and it also gives a little more weight on the rear end, so you can exit corners faster. To explain the negative about a transaxle, I need to explain something called weight torque. So we all know what torque is with an engine with a gearbox. It's multiplying horsepower by distance. A distance from the pivot of rotation. Now with power, this is good. Torque is always amazing, but there's such a thing that is called weight torque. Now weight torque has the same principle. If your engine is right in the center of your car, it's playing pivot of rotation during cornering. So the engine is carrying very little torque, even though it's the major weight, it's not really affecting the car that much with its inertia. Whereas if the engine is right in front, in front of the front wheels, even if it's the same weight, the fact is the weight is magnified by its greater distance from the center of the car, thus making a higher level of weight torque. So now that you've watched the first video and you understand weight torque, we're going to put the NSX and the 296 head to head. Now a transaxle, like I explained, it almost sits out of your rear boot. It's long and heavy. Not as heavy as an engine, but the fact is it has weight. A 430 Ferrari has a 95 kilogram transaxle gearbox. A 458 weighs in at 120 kilograms. Now you see, even if this thing was like 60 kilograms, the fact that the weight is at a greater distance from the engine, which is pivot of rotation, the weight is magnified by the distance it's at, thus making a higher level of weight torque. And the inertia from this weight torque creates an imbalance. So this weight 
will carry the rear out, putting pressure on your tires with its inertia. At high speed lateral g-force, taking unforgiving chicanes and corners, the rear end has a lot of weight that wants to carry the rear out. The fact is, the engine has very little weight torque. Remember in the first video when I talked about mid-engine cars and mid-rear engine cars and rear engine cars giving you snap understeer as soon as you put your foot down? What's crazy is, during acceleration and braking, the rear axle becomes a pivot of a seesaw made by the engine and transaxle counterweighting each other around the axle. This kills stability and creates excessive weight transfer, lifting up the front end during acceleration, during a turn. So you can't floor it. What happens when you're accelerating during and out of a corner, the rear wheels are being swallowed by the weight torque of the gearbox. It's unbalanced. You're gonna get to a part where you're gonna feel it and you're gonna be like, I should have just bought an NSX. The Honda NSX, powered by a 3.2 litre naturally aspirated, sideways mounted, mid rear ship V6 engine. The gearbox is right next to it on the left. Then it's the differential, right by the gearbox. It's so close, it's basically a transaxle, but not one that sticks out of the boot. This gives enough weight on the rear end to plant it, but it does this without giving excessive weight torque hanging off the rear end. There's nothing beyond the differential. Only the exhaust muffler. Lol. The engine has the pivot of rotation during cornering. The front wheels have a long axis to rotate around, while the rear wheels have a super short axis to rotate around. Almost no axis. But the fact is, they are rotating around the engine with wheel speed difference. That's the whole point of having a differential. And as you accelerate through the corner, you can floor it through the corner. And all that will happen is the car will go faster around the corner. It's almost invincible to understeer. A well-balanced car does not have any disturbing weight torque. So it is able to handle a lot of abuse, unforgiving curves and cambers, anything. Take it to Imola or it'll eat that track for breakfast. Take it to the mountain pass. Guess what? It grew up there. This is how the NSX managed to have suspension as soft as marshmallows, but still be an amazing supercar. The NSX R, the ultimate model. When Keiichi Tsuchiya reviewed it said, when a car is built to perfection, it becomes an NSX R. You notice the difference between the NSX R and the normal NSX? A little bit of weight reduction and stiffened suspension. They didn't even put carnards. They didn't even have some clever undercarriage aerodynamic system. Keiichi, the drift king himself said, I will never replace my NSX until I find a better rear end. He also said that when the NSX understeers or oversteers, it is always your fault. The car, it is faultless. This is what you call perfect balance. I do not care if you have 800 or even 2000 horsepower. The NSX is still better balanced. Case closed. And remember what I mentioned about center of gravity while we were talking about drag racing? Yep. The NSX has the engine in the perfect mid-rear position with the gearbox right beside it. The rear tires are punching the engine in the plums. The NSX is a perfectly balanced supercar that needs to be driven with a little bit more aggression than a Ferrari. A Ferrari is delicate. Why? Because it's unbalanced. A Ferrari is not delicate because it wants to be pretty. It's easy to oversteer because it's unbalanced weight torque but don't forget the thing that i mentioned in the past in this video and in the previous video this is one of a billion things that affect your handling the nsx didn't even have a carbon fiber chassis it doesn't have carbon fiber wheels its tires don't have hydrogen in them instead of plain air and if you ask me i would make the nsx a little bit wider give it a wide body kit but between these two, the NSX is better balanced. Yes, the 296, the 488, the 458, they're all faster. They have other tricks up their sleeve and other things that they do that make it faster than an NSX. But Ferrari is doing the forbidden crime. They are balancing an imbalance with an imbalance. Many companies are doing this. I just compare the NSX to Ferrari because Ferrari is the most famous, basically flagship supercar. 
That's how famous they are. Lamborghini has huge, long transaxles that disturb handling. But this is just a little thing. There are a billion other things that influence your handling. Please, put a transaxle in your supercar. It's a really good thing to do. I'm just telling you what perfect balance is. I hope you enjoyed this video of Piston Fury. I'm going to do another episode of Balance in the future, so subscribe. I hope you're enjoying this series, and I hope you watch the first video before watching this one. Take care, my petrol heads.